Hey guys, it's Kat and this is going to be something a little bit different. You guys know that I've been trying a couple of new things on this YouTube channel and I thought that I would try my hand at doing my first movie review. And I thought that the best way to try this out would be to watch a movie that I've been meaning to watch for a very long time that I have habitually avoided. Fifty Shades of Grey. Now, if you're brand new to my channel and this is the first time you've clicked on one of my YouTube videos, I am a lot of things, but one of the things I am is a BDSM submissive. So I figured that I would watch this film and try to get a sense for A, why the community didn't like it, and B, what I think the movie's understanding of BDSM was. Now, I came into the BDSM community in a post Fifty Shades of Grey world. From what I could piece together from the way that people in the BDSM community reacted to um, the BDSM that was expressed in Fifty Shades of Grey, um, it was a misrepresentation. It was presented in a very negative way um, and it was presented in a way that doesn't fully you know, show what BDSM is. It gave people the wrong impression. That's what a lot of people have been telling me. Now, I'm gonna go into this film with a very open mind. I'm not going to try to go into this film with an expectation of disliking it. I'm gonna just watch it and we're gonna have natural reactions and we're gonna see how I personally feel. I figured that we would just go into it with an open mind and let's see how we feel. Let's see the, what impression we get. But before we get into this video, I wanted to let you guys know that it's sponsored by Skillshare. Right now, a lot of us are at home trying to learn new skills, and Skillshare is an amazing community of creatives where people teach each other new creative talents. And Skillshare makes that all easy by giving you guys unlimited classes for $10 a month. From illustration to animation to graphic design to photography, there are so many different types of classes you can take. Right now I'm taking a class that's all about merchandise design and I'm planning on giving you guys some really cool merchandise coming up and it's definitely helping me get it done. Right now, the first 1,000 of you guys who click on the link in the description box will get two free months of Skillshare. Anyways, back to your regularly scheduled programming. Okay, so First things first, this video is going very differently than I planned. Very, very differently than I planned. I have an alternative version of this video that I uploaded to my Patreon for you guys who are curious what this video was going to be. Basically, I have now seen this film five times um, in the course of editing something that could not be posted to YouTube, which I'm very, very frustrated over. But now I have the plot very, very fresh in my mind. So I thought that I would come to you and just give you guys my real honest, over it, tired, I'm done with this film synopsis of the plot, which who knows, maybe that's better. The film starts with Anastasia Steele, who is a mousy brunette who is shy and she's an English major and she's about to graduate from the University of Washington with a degree in English literature. Her roommate Kate is supposed to be interviewing a mysterious billionaire named Christian Grey, but she's sick and it seems like she's not going to be able to do it. So she sends her roommate Anna instead. Anna goes to Christian Grey's Grey house and it is pristine. The women are beautiful, the place is very sleek and modern. She is clearly out of her place, right? So she meets Christian Grey, who to me looks like a little boy in a tuxedo, but you know, everyone's got their type. And she is very, very taken by him, right? She's very, very taken by him. She is struggling to do the interview, so eventually he ends up leading her, and this is where he establishes that he is used to getting his way, <laughs> if you know what I mean. There's a lot of innuendo, because he's a big Dommy McDomerson who likes to do Dommy things, but she doesn't know that yet, and he's still figuring her out, right? So they have a back and forth. Eventually, he starts asking her questions about herself, and he's intrigued, and she's turned on. Anastasia. Christian. And when she leaves, she's clearly excited to have been in the presence of Christian Grey, Dommy McDomerson number five, right? <laughs> so she goes home and Kate can tell that she clearly has the hots for Christian Grey. She's looking longingly at photos of him and she clearly has Christian Grey on the mind. The next day she's at school and she's chewing the gray pencil that he gave her because you know, it's just, she just can't get him off of 
the mine. She's just so taken by this little boy in a tuxedo. So she runs into her friend Jose, who is the only person of color in this film. And Jose is a photography student and he has this new show that he would love to invite her to because Jose is interested in Anna. Jose wants to have sex with Anna. That's established pretty early on, right? But she doesn't quite pick up on it and she very innocently goes off to work, right? So it turns out that Anastasia works at a hardware store and she's got a very, very normal, very, very humble job there, right? While she's working at the store, she gets a phone call from her mom and it turns out that her parents are divorced and her mom is not gonna be able to make it to the graduation. So she hangs up the phone and she's really bummed out about this, but she doesn't have a lot of time to process this because her boss, who totally wants to fuck her, asks her for some help, right? So she follows her boss around the corner and as she turns the corner, Right there in the middle of the store is Christian mother Gray, who of course just happened to be in the area. Just happened to be in the area, you know? It's not stalkerish at all. Not yet, at least. So he goes down a list of items that he's looking for. He's looking for some rope. He's looking for some tape, some bleach, a tarp. He's looking for all types of things that a serial killer needs, right? And of course, these are all supposed to be naughty McNodderson things, but Anna is just oblivious. She's innocent. She, she doesn't pick up on any of it, right? So she goes to check him out and he's asking her about the interview, whether or not she has everything that she's gonna need for the interview. And she mentions that she's having a really hard time clearing a photo. So Christian Gray has a great idea. He'll come the next day to their school and will do a photo shoot so that they have photos for the article, right? And so the next day comes and Jose, of course, is the photographer. And Christian Gray is just, you know, Dommy McDomerson on Domerson Lane. He can't smile. He can't show emotion. All he can do is stare deep into Anna's eyes, which of course isn't creepy at all. Anna is flattered by this and taken by this. She's giggling in the corner with her roommate, Kate, and she tells her that after the photo shoot, they're gonna go get coffee. And of course, this is just a giggle giggle moment. After the photo shoot, Christian Grey asks Anna if she has a boyfriend and if Jose is her boyfriend and if she wants to f her boss. <laughs> And she basically says no and friend zones everyone and they go on to have their coffee date. While on this coffee date, Christian Grey asks Anna if she is romantic. And Anna says, well, she's an English lit major. Of course she's a romantic, right? The conversation continues for a moment, but it ends really abruptly because Christian Grey just says that he just, just can't do this. Anna chases after him and asks why, why the date is ending so prematurely. And he says, I don't do the girlfriend thing. Which is a convenient excuse that I've heard quite a bit through my life. Anna goes home and she's really, really sad, but Kate and her are getting ready to go out to a graduation party. They are ready to paint the town red. On their way out, she notices that she's got a big stack of these brand new first edition books, books that she loves. And of course, these books are from Christian Grey, but they're on their way out and she's ready to put all of her Christian Grey thoughts behind her. So Anna gets really, really drunk. And you know, as somebody who has graduated college, I remember what this was like. Girl, I got so wasted at the, <laughs> the graduation party. I was so ready to just be done with school. Um, and she gets a little too drunk. She gets a little too wasted, right? And she goes to the bathroom and she opens up her phone and she's about to delete Christian Gray's number. But instead she does what a lot of us have done in the past and she decides to call him instead. While she's on the phone with Christian Grey, Christian can clearly tell that Anna is drunk and becomes really, really concerned. He starts asking where she is, asking what's going on, if she's safe. But Anna is just trying to really make it clear that she doesn't care. She doesn't even care. That's why that's why she called him. She doesn't care what he thinks or or she's not interested anyway. You know, that's that's what she's trying to get, that's what she's trying to get across at least, right? So she hangs up the phone and almost seconds after, she gets a phone call back from Christian Gray telling her that he knows exactly where she is and he's coming to pick her up, which isn't creepy, not creepy at all. It's romantic actually. Anyway, so she leaves the bathroom and she's on her way back to join her friends and Jose is there and Jose is a little tipsy and Jose thinks this is the time where he's going to shoot his shot. So Jose tries to start having the conversation with her and slowly tries to have a 
sort of intimate moment with her. She tries to kiss her. And just as he's going in for the kiss, Christian Grey white knights it up and pushes him out of the way. He grabs Anna, and of course he is the knight in shining armor. Christian offers to take her back to the hotel room, but before she leaves with Christian, she's like, what about Kate? And it turns out that Christian has hooked Kate up with his brother, Elliot. So the two leave the bar, and I guess everything is a-okay. She wakes up the next morning, and she's wearing different clothes, and of course she's wondering, how the hell she got into these new clothes and where exactly did Christian Grey sleep? It's at that point where he tells her that apparently he changed her. He undressed her and put her into new clothes and also slept right next to her. That's exactly what happened, but they didn't have sex, nothing weird. He says that he's not into necrophilia or anything like that, but he does let her know. If you were mine, you wouldn't be able to sit down for a week. What? which of course confused Anna. When she asked Christian Grey why he did what he did, he says that he's incapable of leaving her alone, which is romantic. It's romantic, of course. Christian Grey tells her that the books were actually an apology for him not being able to be the man that she wanted. So he drives Anna home and drops her off and as they're walking into her apartment, of course, Kate is being a little naughty girl on the couch with Elliot, and it's tee hee 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 hee, oh my gosh, da 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 da. They seem to be hitting it off quite well, I guess you could say. And Christian drops her off and says, Later's baby. Which is disgusting, absolutely disgusting to me. Um, don't ever say that to a woman. And Christian tells her that he's gonna send his driver to pick her up after work. So the next day, she's at the hardware store and she again can't stop thinking about Christian Grey. He's so sexy, he's so rich, he's so protective, I guess, right? She leaves work and Christian Grey's driver comes and picks her up and they drive to this helicopter tarmac. So of course, Anna is like, oh my gosh, I'm about to go into a helicopter, I'm so excited. And she gets into a helicopter and I gotta say, I don't know if you can tell already, but I was not a huge fan of this film. But the one thing about this movie that I did like was the soundtrack. The soundtrack was ooh, the, the flavor. So they land at Christian Gray's apartment and he lives in this swanky, nice, marble floored apartment. He's sexy, he's a bachelor, he's rich. And Anna is horny. Let's just be honest, Anna's horny. She's horny. So they sit down and the first thing that Christian Grey does is hand her an NDA and a glass of wine. And she very uncritically signs it, says that she would never tell anyone about what they do here. So Anna asks if this is the time where they're going to make love, obviously being quite horny when she does so. And Christian Grey leans in and says in his most Dommy McDomerson voice, I don't make love, I fuck hard. <laughs> oh, if Christian Grey were real, I would have laughed, I would laugh right in his face. But in, in this movie, she's very, very taken by him, right? And so, Throughout the entire film, Christian Grey up to this point has referenced consent and wanting to bring her into things consensually. After he has her sign the NDA, they walk to another portion of his apartment and they get to a door. And Christian says that behind this door is his playroom. And she of course is imagining, you know, some guy's fucking man cave with an Xbox or whatever. And she's like, y you mean like there's an Xbox there? And and uh, you know, like a pool table or something? Like what's what's back there? And he says, I want to make sure that, you know, you, you know what you're doing and everything's consensual and da 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 da. And he shows her hit the playroom. And it's at this point where we figure out that Christian Grey is into some kinky shit. We get a full view of his playroom. I, I gotta be honest with you guys, I'm a little disappointed with his playroom. But I guess I expected to see like nicer BDSM furniture, um, just more stuff, really. It's very, I mean, for a home dungeon though, I mean, it's not it's not bad. It just, for me, it feels like it's more of a display room than it, than it is a playroom, if that makes any sense. Now, of course, Anna is vanilla and very, very confused by this. And so she's not sure if Christian Grey is the one who gets spanked 
or does the spanking? And Christian Grey makes it really clear very early on that he is Dommy McDomerson on Domerson Lane and he is the only one who gets spanked in this relationship. That is who he is. <laughs> right? And so Anna is clearly on the fence, very, very nervous about all of this. At this point, he explains exactly what he's looking for. He tells her that he's looking for a live-in weekend slave who is willing to sign a contract that essentially allows him to do virtually anything to, to her, right? That's essentially what it is. And she is kind of him and hot and they're talking about the contract and whether or not she's gonna even know what she's signing on to. And it's at this point in the conversation where it's discovered that Anna is actually a virgin. And of course this turns Christian Grey on more than anything. There is nothing in this world that has turned Christian Grey on more than this exact moment. In fact, he says something along the lines of, where have you been all my life? You know, he's just so taken by her, right? And so he grabs her and picks her up and they go into the other room to rectify the situation. They have sex. It's a very underwhelming sex scene. The music is fire though. The music throughout this entire thing is great. I have to reiterate. So they wake up the next morning and Anna is already in the kitchen cooking this guy breakfast. She's already cooking breakfast for this man. The dig must have been real good. The dig, girl, it's you. You would have to give me life-changing dick for me to cook you breakfast. She's clearly getting a lot more comfortable with Christian Grey. And so Christian decides to do a little bit of an impromptu BDSM scene. He takes one of his ties and decides to tie it around her wrist. And they have, you know, a kinky little BDSM -y scene, right? And it's getting hot and heavy and they're really getting into it. And then his mom shows up. His mom very abruptly interrupts the scene and Christian Grey has to run and get some clothes on and interact with his mom. And it's really clear that there is at least, there is some sort of animosity or some sort of unsorted issue that he has with his mother. His mother, however, could not be more ecstatic to finally meet one of the various women that Christian Grey has been involved with. She tells Anna that her daughter Mia is in town and she invites her to a dinner that they're going to be having later that week. And of course, Anastasia accepts. Christian Grey drives Anna home and on the way home, Christian Grey has clearly taken the scenic route. They take a little bit of a walk and Anna asks Christian Grey about submission. And it's at this point where Christian Grey reveals that when he was a teenager, this woman apparently groomed him and was his dominant for five years. He explains to her the gratifying nature of BDSM and why exactly he enjoyed being a submissive and why she potentially would enjoy it as well. It seems like Anna is still not entirely sold on it, but it gives her a bit to think about. Christian Grey drops her off at home and hands her the contract that she's supposed to review and sign and deliver to him to start their BDSM relationship. Christian Grey tells Anna to email him if she has any questions or concerns, and she says that she doesn't have the ability to do so because her computer is broken, right? So she walks into her apartment, and as she enters her apartment, she sees a man in her apartment setting up a brand new computer. And of course it's a MacBook, but we won't talk about that in this video. Anna spends the next couple of days looking over the contract and all the various things. She starts Googling things that she doesn't understand and sending Christian Grey messages. And just, she's trying to process all of this. It's all brand new to her and it's a lot to take in. Christian Grey, on the other hand, is becoming very, very, very impatient and really wants to get an answer from her quickly. As Anna is starting to figure out the contract, she very playfully decides to send Christian Grey an email that says, it was nice knowing you, dot, dot, dot. The next day, Anna is doing laundry and she comes into her apartment and despite the fact that subtext is not legible through text, Christian Grey decided to let himself into her apartment and wait in the darkness to surprise her when she comes home. Which is romantic, of course, not creepy at all for a man to let himself into your apartment. Not creepy at all whatsoever. When, when he pops out of the corner with a glass of wine, instead of being scared like I would be if I told someone to leave me alone and they decided to show up to my apartment, um, they have rough sex. They have very, very rough sex and Anna seems to enjoy it quite a bit. 
very abruptly after they have sex, Christian starts asking her about the contract. And it's clear that she's still on the fence. So he leaves in a huff and she is left hot and bothered. So the next day she decides to send him an email saying that she's ready to negotiate the contract, but she wants to do it in a very fancy, formal way. So the following day she shows up to his office and she's dressed in her business best and they sit in a boardroom meeting and they go over the contract. And honestly, this is one of my favorite parts of the movie. They very playfully and very formally go through the contract and Anna starts striking things off that she doesn't want. And Christian Grey is so impressed by her, so impressed by the way that she's conducting herself that he decides to sweeten the deal. Earlier in the film, he said that she wasn't romantic, but just for her, because she's doing so well, he decides that he's going to cut her some slack and give her one day out of the week where they go on a real date. Things get a little hot and heavy in the boardroom, but they don't go anywhere. Christian is expecting that by the end of this meeting, Anna's going to sign it. But she says that she still needs some time to think and look over the contract, that it's clear that Anna is enjoying the little bit of power she has in this direct moment. The next day, it's finally graduation and Christian Grey is ready to give his big old graduation speech. While giving a speech, Anna notices that Christian Grey is actually wearing the same exact necktie that he used in their little impromptu BDSM scene. While her mother wasn't able to make it, her biological father was, and her father seems so impressed with Christian Grey. He couldn't be happier that that is a particular man that is dating his daughter. The two go back to Anna's apartment and they pour some champagne. They're celebrating the graduation. And Christian Grey lets Anna know that he has a surprise for her. He leads her outside and it's revealed that Christian Grey has purchased her a brand new car. When she asks what happened to her old car, Christian lets her know that they've actually sold her old car, which of course wasn't a violation at all. It's just, you know, he was getting her a new car, so who cares? Anna is clearly getting a little frustrated with Christian Grey and she rolls her eyes slightly, which apparently makes Christian Grey want to punish her. So he drags Anna back into the apartment, bends her over his knee and gives her a few light spankings and then tells her that he has to rush off to work. This again leaves her hot and heavy. After Christian Grey leaves, she gets a phone call from her mother who can tell that she's not in the best state. Her mother apologizes for missing her graduation and says that if she ever needs to get away, if she needs a break away from this Christian Grey guy, she can come to visit her in Georgia and just have some mother-daughter time. The next day, Anastasia is at Christian Grey's house and there is a picture of them on the front of the newspaper. But Christian Grey doesn't really seem to mind. It seems that he is okay with people at least insinuating that they are together, that they are dating. Christian Grey leads her to the playroom and they have their first official BDSM scene. Did that hurt? No. You see? Less of your fears in your head. That was actually a really good point. Like a lot of BDSM, it's really about it looking scary. It looks scarier than it actually is. Now, of course, there is heavier stuff that is scary. But a lot of BDSM is, is more kind of about it seeming like you're in danger, but you're really not. After their scene, Anna wakes up alone in her bed and there's a dress sitting at the foot of her bed. She puts it on and goes downstairs where she sees Christian Grey all dressed up and ready to go. Christian Grey reminds her that tonight is the dinner that his mother invited her to. They dance for a little bit before heading off to dinner. When they get to the dinner, it's really clear that the Greys are a very interesting bunch. Mia speaks French, and Mia was played by Rita Ora, by the way, and they're just a really interesting, eclectic bunch of people. At dinner, Anna mentions that she's going to be visiting her mother in Georgia, and this pisses Christian Grey off. So much that they have to excuse themselves and go out into the yard to have a conversation about it. This is where some things kind of come to a head. Anna is really, really confused by why Christian Grey would have needed to agree for her to go and see her mother. It's her mom, she can go do what she wants and she doesn't get it. And she's also acknowledging that while he's trying to control her in this way, that she still doesn't understand 
where all of this comes from, that she still doesn't get the BDSM, that she isn't totally happy, and that she would like for him to be more open, more honest, more transparent. But it's clear that he's not entirely ready to do that. That night when Anna is fast asleep, Christian Grey decides to tell her something. He tells her that he was born to a mother who was addicted to drugs, a mother who did sex work, and a mother who neglected him. He says all of this while Anna is fast asleep, but it's clear that this was something that took him a lot to say even in that position. Anna visits her mother in Georgia, and it's clear that despite the fact that she has been avoiding her all throughout the film, Anna does have some sort of jealousy for the type of relationship her mother has with her stepfather. They are overtly romantic and just cute and just, you know, adorable. And that's not quite the relationship that she has with Christian Grey. So on her way to bed, she texts Christian Grey and says that she misses him. And he responds saying that he also misses her. He also lets her know that he's on his way to have dinner with a friend. And this friend just happens to be the woman who groomed and abused him when he was 15 years old. Obviously this pisses Anna off and she is not happy that he's going and having dinner with a woman who technically abused him. Christian Grey reassures her that she's just a friend, there's nothing serious going on there, and there's nothing to be afraid of. Clearly, Anna doesn't buy it. Clearly, Anna doesn't buy it, so she doesn't respond. When she doesn't respond to this text message, he decides to call her, and Anna does not answer the phone. The next day, Anna is at brunch with her mother, and they're sitting around just having cocktails, having good old girl time, and she gets a text message. And the text message is referencing the cocktail that she currently has in her hand. Christian Grey, somehow, some way, has figured out exactly where she is and flown to Georgia to see her. But again, this does not really seem to bother her. So she decides to cut mother and daughter time short and Christian takes her to fly some airplanes. Christian introduces Anna as his girlfriend, and this is clearly a really important moment for Anna. She's never been referred to by Christian as his girlfriend, so she's really excited to hear it. They go up in the planes, and it's a cute, adorable moment, and Anna is still trying to get Christian to be more intimate with her. He's calling her his girlfriend. It seems like they're on the right track, but it still seems like he's afraid to open up. And Anna keeps asking him, what exactly is he afraid of? Why isn't he willing to open up? And in the midst of that conversation, he gets an emergency call from work and has to fly back to Seattle to attend to it. Anna also manages to fly back to Seattle and goes directly to Christian Gray. Christian is clearly not out of the weeds and is very, very frustrated with work. So Anna naturally asks if she should be here or if she should just go home. And Christian Grace says that there's nothing that he wants more than for her to be there in that exact moment. He tells her to go to the BDSM room and wait for him. He's gonna be there in 15 minutes. So they have a BDSM scene and it's honestly fairly light, but again, the music that was going on during the whole thing was great. It was that it was great, right? But it was a very, very light scene. And again, Anna wakes up in her bed alone. There's no aftercare, but Dommy McDomerson is downstairs playing his piano. Anna goes downstairs to join him and ask why all the songs he plays on his piano are so gosh darn sad. And then she really starts trying to peel back the layers of the onion. She starts asking him why he's into BDSM, why he wants to punish her, why he's wanting to do what he wants to do to her. And he's dodging the questions again. He's saying that if she ever really knew the full story, it would be too much for her to handle. It would be a total 180 and she would no longer be interested in him. And he's afraid of that and blah, 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 blah. And she's frustrated by this conversation. She's really, really frustrated that she still doesn't totally get what he wants. And so she says to him something that you should never say to a dom. Punish me. Show me how bad it can be. I want you to show me the worst. So the two go downstairs and he says to her, I'm going to give you six spankings and I want you to count for each one I give you. So he gives her six very, very firm spankings, very, very firm spankings. And he goes up to touch her. He goes up to bring her back to earth, as we say in the BDSM community. And she flips out. 
she flips out. She's got tears falling down her face. She's crying. And it's clear that she was traumatized in some way by the experience. She turns to him and says, is this what you want? Is this what you want? Is this what you're looking for? And obviously Christian Grey is confused. He just spent the entire film talking about him wanting this thing. So he's a little confused by why exactly she's having the reaction she's having. So she storms out of the playroom and goes to her room and she starts crying profusely. And she tells him that she never wants him to touch her ever again. The next morning, it's really clear that their relationship is over and she starts talking about getting her old car back and returning all the gifts and she's done with him. And that is how Fifty Shades of Grey ends with her leaving the same way she came. Hello. Christian. So this movie really tried my last nerve, my absolute last nerve. So I'm gonna take a break. I'm gonna walk away for a second. I'm gonna decompress, have a glass of wine, and we're gonna come back and talk about how exactly I felt about this film as a BDSMer. <sighs> There's dominant women, there's a lot of, a lot of dominant women out there, wonderful, talented, skilled, amazing women who have these relationships. Mm -hmm. and so women can be dominant too. It's not like a gendered be. thing where women are submissive, men are dominant. It's not always like yes. that. No, it's not. Is everyone like solidly dominant or submissive? Like, is that, like, do you have to pick one? Yeah, so some people will tell you that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, it's the same thing as like being bisexual. They're like, oh, you just haven't found it out. Right? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm I'm a, I'm more of a switch than anything else. Um, okay. I identify as kinkster, which means mm. that I enjoy a wide variety of kinky activities. Oh. Um, oftentimes that means I'm on top. Sometimes it means I'm on bottom. Um, we also have top bottom power dynamics, just like a lot of other communities do. Um, for us, the top is the one who gives the thing and the bottom is the one who takes it. Oh, okay. Uh, you don't have to be one thing. You can be whatever makes sense to you. Well, that was a doozy. I thought I would slip into something a little bit more comfortable and talk to you about my final thoughts for this film. As you can tell by the way that I reacted to the end of this movie, I didn't love it. I didn't love it. Um, it's a movie that I've honestly, if I went the rest of my life without ever seeing it again, I think it would be too soon. <laughs> I don't need to see it again. I'm glad that we watched it, but um, yeah, it just wasn't particularly great. And you know, I don't know if you guys need to hear this from me or not, but if I saw Christian Grey at a dungeon, I would probably laugh at him. Or <laughs> if I if I wouldn't laugh at him, I would be really snarky. Like I could just I could already like see how I would react. I would be so snarky and terrible. I guess for me, when it comes to like the kind of guys that I want to be spanked by personally, they're usually men who carry themselves a certain way, um, especially men who don't need to brag. Like I would be, so, I would be so turned off by the bragging. I would be so turned off by the flaunting of the wealth. All of this would turn me off so much because it would just come off to me as really insecure. Most of the dominants I know are some of the most humble men you will ever meet, right? So I'm gonna start off by saying this. Um, I feel like one of the criticisms that I kept hearing about this film was that it was an unrealistic portrayal of BDSM. I have only seen the one movie. I have not read the book. I um, have tried really hard to avoid any sort of videos or other reviews of this movie. I just wanted to give you guys my true, honest, real feelings. And from what I've heard of the book, the movie and the book are very different. So I'm gonna start off by saying something that may or may not be an unpopular opinion. I did not think that this was an inaccurate portrayal of BDSM. Is it the kind of BDSM that I do? Absolutely not. But do some people indeed engage in this particular type of BDSM? Yes. So I've met a lot of men like Christian Grey. I've, I've met so many men like Christian Grey and I don't know if it's the, again, if this is a result of a post Fifty Shades of Grey world, but I've met a lot of men like Christian Grey, these guys who are just kind of entitled, they want what they want, and they are excited by women who don't quite know what they want, right? A lot of dominants don't like experienced bottoms or submissives because you walk in with 
boundaries. You walk in with experience. You walk in knowing what you want and don't want, right? There are certain dominants, those dominants who are really excited about the new girls, they're excited because they get to define to that person what BDSM is. It's very common for men to meet women like that, for these male dominants to meet women like that and be really excited. And it's, it's actually a really similar story to what was portrayed in the film. A lot of times you'll, this woman will meet a guy who's a dominant and, and she'll be really taken by him. She'll be really infatuated with him. He presents the BDSM thing to her and she, because she's so taken by him, will just sort of agree the BDSM thing is fine, but it's not, it's not fine. And in the back of her head, she's saying to herself, I'm gonna get him to the point where he doesn't really want to do this BDSM stuff and he just loves me, right? That's the way that a lot of vanillas think. If you just signed the contract, you wouldn't have to think Why about that. I care so much about the contract, Christian. Don't you like me the way I am? But I guess for me, it's just that's just such an overwhelmingly toxic message. You know, you know that I like this thing and you're going to hold it against me for liking it. That doesn't seem fair especially when I'm up front with you. See, to me, the, the whole film should have ended after Christian Grey walked out on the first date and truly, probably in a better ending, after Anna was about to delete his number if she just deleted his number, you know? The thing that angered me about the end is that Christian Grey is very clear about what he wants. He's very clear about what his interests are. He's very, very, very clear. And there was something really bizarre about watching, you know, him do this scene with this woman who has all throughout this film, yes, maybe expressed a bit of hesitation, but throughout the film, this woman knows that he is into some kinky shit and now she, he's spanking her and she's traumatized, you know? And that's that's really wild. But here's the thing though. A lot of men like Christian Grey, they, again, they love that inexperienced, I've never done this before kind of girl. And what you're gonna get with somebody like that is that they're gonna change their mind. You know, they're gonna have experiences with you that are bad and that's going to affect how they look at those experiences for the rest of their life. So I say all that to say that being a dominant, you know, we think a lot about the submissive being safe and I, you know, I'm there with you as a, as a submissive, but the reality is doms need to watch out for themselves too. Doms need to be able to be aware of the fact that if they play with somebody inexperienced, there's a possibility that that person might have an experience with you and then later reflect on it and say that it was something that it wasn't. This is what you want. You want to see, you want to see me like this. Anna. Don't come near me. So I want to qualify what I'm saying here really quickly because I know that people could potentially misinterpret it. Christian Grey in the mythology of this movie is an experienced dominant, right? He should know what to do and what not to do and what she can take and what she can't take. And a responsible dominant, AKA the dominance that I personally would respect, would not look at somebody like Anastasia Steele, somebody who's on the fence, who's not sure, who doesn't really know what she wants and give her their worst. He would never do that because he knows that that can scar them. He knows that that could be something that would scar them long term. So what he would do is would probably be like, hey, you know, I can give you a little bit and we can work up to that, but I'm not going to do it just because you said I'm going to do it. Also, I'm the dominant here. It was irresponsible for Christian Grey to play with her as hard as he played with her because she was not prepared for it. And had she been more prepared for it, it might have been a more satisfactory scene. She might have actually enjoyed it, but something like that would probably take her years to build up. So it was very selfish and not very caring of Christian to actually give her what she was asking for. I had so many thoughts when Anna got up and said, don't touch me, and then started judging him for doing the thing. Because with the kind of guys like Christian Grey who come into the community and they're, they're good looking, they've got resources and they've got, you know, toys or whatever, there's a, there's a, there are a lot of rumors about those kind of men. And almost all the rumors are there was some sort of accident 
during a BDSM scene. And then that gets translated into he abused me. And next thing you know, everyone in the BDSM community is an abuser. Dominance that I know personally, men that I respect would not look at somebody who's never done this before and be like, oh, I'm so excited. They would say, hey, maybe come back in a, in a couple of years when you figured this stuff out because it's just not worth the risk. It's not worth the risk, you know? Now for me, there is a very distinct difference between somebody who does BDSM in their bedroom with their partner, and that's kind of where it begins and ends, and the people like myself who are part of a BDSM community, who are part of a community of BDSMers who are looking out for each other, questioning each other, holding each other accountable, and ultimately just creating community amongst each other. There's a very stark difference, in my opinion, between your bedroom BDSMer and your BDSMer who participates in the culture, in the community. I can see how a lot of people thought that it portrayed BDSM poorly because it truly isn't a reflection of most BDSM stuff. It just isn't. I think it's a pretty good depiction of bedroom BDSM and especially what a man who did bed bedroom BDSM would do if he got the resources. So here's the thing, I really wanna give people who are not BDSMers perspective on the BDSM community. That's kind of why I wanted to make this video because I knew that there were going to be a lot of people who saw Fifty Shades of Grey and felt like this is what BDSM is. I was her submissive for six years. Now, the one thing I will give Christian Grey credit for is that he started as a submissive. And that's actually something that I think is really good because in my experience as a submissive and as a bottom, the men who say that they are just too good to ever bottom or they're just too this or that to ever bottom, in my, just for me, they're usually not very good players. Very rarely have I met a man who has never bottomed who's actually a good top. Part of being a good top is being able to see what you're doing, being able to know what you're doing. And there's really no way to understand if you're giving the right sensation to a person who's bottoming for you, unless you've experienced that sensation. Now, of course, you don't have to be a submissive in order to experience those sensations. But for a lot of people, the classic way a dom becomes a dom is he first starts as a submissive, servicing another dominant, right? And through the course of him servicing this dominant, he learns about service, he learns about being a dominant, he learns about how to properly do that. And then through him coming up through that, through him expressing interest in domination and then trying and then being trained and things like that, being watched over by other dominants, he will eventually be awarded the title. And, and if I'm being honest, now I came into BDSM in a post Fifty Shades of Grey world. I've met a lot of men who say I'm a dominant because I say I'm a dominant and that's just how it is. Those people are very, very different from the people who just, who went through this process that I just described where they started as a submissive, they started to express interest in domination and then were trained and then given the title of dominant because dominant is a title that's given and a lot of people don't necessarily get that you can call yourself Dommy McDomerson on Domerson Lane, but you're probably not gonna get respect for it in the larger BDSM community unless people know that you're a good player. And while there is a lot to be said about gatekeeping in the BDSM community, I'll be completely honest and say that I think it's one of the best ways to get a good scene is gatekeeping, is to have all of these sort of conversations about what consent is and how to hit somebody safely and know that that person is trustworthy, is not manipulating somebody, is not doing this, you know. I think that that's all, these are all things that are really, 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 really important, but they're overlooked in a, I guess, post Fifty Shades of Grey world where a guy who owns a couple of suits says that, you know, he's a dominant and I guess we're just all supposed to take his word for it, you know. Oh, I exercise control in all things, Miss Steele. I will just say that my general criticism of Fifty Shades of Grey is this is just an over-exaggerated version of your typical over-idealized heterosexual love story. You've got this shy, submissive woman who doesn't really have much of a direction in life, who meets this big, rich, dominant man 
who wants to give her the world. It's really just these exaggerations of these already commonly accepted tropes. And I think the thing that I personally really appreciate about BDSM is its subversiveness. Because while yes, there are a lot of men in the BDSM community who are dominant in their daily lives, who are also dominant in their kink lives, that's often not really the case. And I think the thing that I will say about Christian Grey that I found to be really confusing is that Christian Grey is almost this perfect character. We know that he has flaws. We understand that he has flaws. We know that he has this dark past, right? But Christian Grey in his daily life is very in control of his shit. He's got an entire, you know, building full of people who are eager to please him. The, he's got money, cars, he's got basically anything, a, a, you know, a capitalist man would ever want. Which one's yours? Oh. He just doesn't have, at least right now, a, a submissive. But I think the thing that confused me a bit about the way that Christian Grey's character functioned is that there was really nothing about his character that told me that when he's in BDSM, which BDSM for most of us is escape, you know, it is us deciding to choose a role that allows us to play. It's play, you know, it's, it's us sort of doing a thing we don't usually do in our daily life, which is part of why it's so taboo for many people, right? I know a lot of men in their daily life who are dominant in the BDSM community who maybe do to some degree identify as dominant in their daily lives, but oftentimes they aren't really able to live out that fantasy of them being the dominant person. Oftentimes there are so many things in the way of that, you know, whether it's their class, whether it's their current ability, you know, there are so many things that, you know, even if this man desires dom domination, he doesn't get it naturally. So BDSM for many of these particular types of men is a way of sort of making that standardized so that they can retreat into it and indulge into a thing that they don't get in their daily life, right? That's kind of the point for a lot of BDSMers is to escape. For myself personally, I'm somebody who, you know, in my daily life, I'm very in control of my stuff. I've kind of always had to be hyper aware of how I carry myself, how I'm coming off to other people, how I'm speaking, how I'm walking, how I'm talking, whether or not I look a certain way, you know, I think a lot about all of these things and these are things that are constantly buzzing in my head. And what I appreciate about being a submissive is that I can allow somebody to sort of take the reins, right? I can allow them to lead me in a certain direction and fully trust that, that they're gonna do a good job at doing it, right? Why exactly is Grey a dominant, you know? I. The only thing I could say that may or may not lend itself to Christian Grey being a dominant is when we see his family, it's pretty clear that he has a bad relationship with his mother and that his mother probably is the more dominant of the two um, of his parents, right? So it makes you just kind of wonder what that's about. Like, did he get some of that from some bad relationship with his mom? We don't know. I know the other book's answer based on how you guys respond to this one. I may watch the others, but yeah, to me, it was just kind of like, I just don't understand why you need a weekend slave, a contract, all of these things. Why are you drawn to that? And I think that the, the film could have shown the audience something. Didn't need to show her, but at least the audience, you know, there's nothing in his life that he doesn't seem in control of. So it almost doesn't entirely make sense to me that if he were to be in a BDSM dynamic that he would choose domination. I really didn't understand why Anna was starting to like it. What about her experiences would lend her to be in a position where she was more open to BDSM? I, set, I kept thinking like, does she like it or is it a case of her putting up with it just cause? Who knows, maybe both, I don't know. I can only, I can only read that she was being, I don't know, just kind of biting the bullet so that she could get closer to Christian Grey. I don't know. 
Like for me, I really enjoy being flogged because it feels like a really nice massage, right? We don't really get any insight into how she's feeling about this really. We just know that she is a smiling mess because she's in love with Christian Grey, which fair, but uh, I don't know. Why do you want to punish me? Anna. Why do you want to hurt me? I would never do anything to you that you couldn't handle. But why do you even want to do anything to me at all, Christian? For a lot of people, BDSM is a deeply personal thing. So it's not, we're not just gonna come out and tell you, you know, our deepest, darkest secrets and why we like doing what we do. It's a lot easier for me just to say, hey, I like being spanked. Do you want to do that? Shh, cool, let's do that. But having those deeper conversations, I mean, that's that's what I love about my partner. Him and I, we've been together for four years and we are still peeling back the onion. We are still figuring out why all of these things are exciting to us, right? But we're doing it in a safe way and we care about each other, right? So about the BDSM contract, right? I think the contract, you can look at it a couple of ways, right? Firstly, I'll say that a consent contract is kind of just missing the point, you know? These consent contracts are not legally binding, first and foremost, and they really do completely ignore the reality of what consent is, you know? So, so a consent contract doesn't really work that way, right? But that all being said, that all being said, I think what some people from outside of the BDSM community might not understand is that for a lot of BDSMers who have a contract, the contract is part of the play, right? And part of, I know for a lot of submissives is how exciting it is that you signed a contract, right? Um, that means a lot. It's exciting that you, you signed a contract and that you're on a contract and that this person is leading you in this way or that way, right? That's the exciting part for a lot of submissives, right? But that all being said, when you watch the film, it's really clear that the contract really isn't part of Christian Grey's play. It might be something that Anna is using to push and pull or whatever in the way that he's pushed and pulled her, but it's not entirely entirely the same, you know? Christian Grey takes this contract really, really seriously. And as much as he offered to do naughty things to her in the boardroom, I think that it's not going to be a unanimous sort of thing that the contract is part of the play. I don't, I think it's very serious for Christian, whereas she doesn't take it quite as serious because in her opinion, he should love her anyway, right? Um, so yeah, I think that, that, that there's a couple of nuances with that contract. I thought that, that it was great that they showed her saying no, that they showed her saying, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that, I'm curious about that, you know, that was all great. I know that this is explored in the other movies and the other books, but for me, the domination just all felt so unnecessary. Even though I really don't want to watch this movie ever again, I didn't hate it. It wasn't like the worst movie ever in the world. It was watchable. I thought at some points it was really, really beautiful. But yeah, I mean, the ending really pissed me off. Like I actually got mad because that's how it ended, you know, because it really did frame BDSM as abusive. It just did, you know, like, you're supposed to watch that scene and feel like Christian Grey is this terrible, terrible person. But Christian Grey told Anna exactly who he was from day one. And I think that in both of these situations, these two people were just not really wanting to believe that the other person wanted what the other person said they wanted. She said that she wanted love and romance. He said that he wanted kinky sex. Neither of them wanted to give it to each other. Like it's doesn't, it doesn't, they, the opposites don't really attract. Anyway, what did you guys think of Fifty Shades of Grey? I would love to know what you guys have to say. I read so many bad things about, about this movie and I'm not saying it's not bad, it is, it's pretty bad. And I'm not saying that Christian Grey isn't creepy, he definitely is, but it wasn't as worse as I thought it was gonna be. I thought it was gonna be much, 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 much worse. I will say though, the sex, the sex scenes for the most part didn't do much for me, neither did the BDSM. I almost feel like you could remove, well, no, you couldn't really, if you removed the BDSM, it would be very, very boring. Thank you so much for watching this video. Let me know if you guys want me to make more like it. 
totally open to watch movies. It's all we've been doing in quarantine. Anyway, on that note, I'm going to go. I will talk to you guys next week. Bye.